Okay, so good morning. And uh, before we start, let's pray again that even the people on the internet can uh, enter the prayer with us. Dear God, thank you, Jesus. Thank you that we are learning your heart. We are learning your character, which is revealed in your word. Thank you, God, that you showed us our Father in heaven. You exegeto, you described him, you explained him to us, and we are learning about him. Thank you, Lord. This is why we came here at this moment, just to embrace the truth and be loved by you and be built up and corrected by your word. Thank you, Lord. Speak to us, we pray. We want to hear you clearly. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And uh, before I start for the beginning, I would like to ask our special guest. Uh, I know if I should say from Azerbaijan or from Russia, but because we are in Serbia and the Serbs, they love the Russia so much. So I'll say he is a Russian, which is truth. So let's uh, uh, hear from Vadim. And he will tell us about his travels in the Balkans. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Tomas. So, uh, I'll start with... Two years ago, I went with my wife to Lvov Church. We had a great time there with the church, and after that, we went to Belarus and we, you know, we bought ticket, everything was fine. And on the border with Belarus at two o'clock at night, you know, when the border guards came, they said, do you have insurance? And we said, no, we haven't heard about it that we need it. So they told us, get out of the train. And I said, yeah, but maybe we can buy the insurance. They said, no, we don't sell it here. You have to go all the way back, yeah, to get it. So it was like a disaster. You know, at two o'clock we had to get off and we had to wait until morning at that train station. And after that, a truck came with Belarusian border guards, like seven border guards with Kalashnikovs with German shepherd dog and an officer, and they took us back like seven kilometers away to Ukrainian border. They put us off the border and let us there. It was pretty cold, so praise God. I had a coat which I bought in Kiev. I, my wife wore it, so she was fine. So finally we bought our insurance, we crossed the border, and of course we lost our uh, apartment which we rented in Minsk because you know it was taken and we lost our train ticket and we had to get to Minsk through different you know uh, sitting trains and it took us a long time so eventually we got there so why am I talking about this you know when you go to the country for the first time especially with a passport as mine. You don't know what to expect. Although you heard, I mean, you read on the internet that everything should be okay, you don't need visa or anything. But anyway, so since I came here three weeks ago, you know, there were absolutely no problems with my passport. There were absolutely no problems with border crossing when I came to Serbia. No one asked me any questions. So, but I still was a bit worried when I was going to Bosnia, because also it's like the first time and, you know, who knows what they want from me. But by God's grace, I crossed the border with Bosnia, and later I crossed the border with Montenegro, then I crossed the border with Albania, then I crossed the border with Macedonia, and of course back. And there were absolutely no problems. I mean, I was so surprised about it. But praise God, because Pastor Tomas was praying for me, and I also was praying, and God was faithful. He just took me in his hands through all of these countries. 
So to give a short report about this travel, when I went to Bosnia and I saw people that spoke the same language that here in Serbia, I mean, they looked the same. I mean, most of them looked the same. I couldn't tell like if that person is Christian or if that person is Muslim. Absolutely no way to tell. I mean, they look the same. But sometimes I saw these women with wearing hijabs, you know, tall Slavic girls with blue eyes, and they were wearing hijabs, and that was a pain. I, I prayed for, I prayed for them that God would show them who He is, that God would show them His love. Yeah, so I had these difficult feelings in Bosnia. So after that, I went to Montenegro, and God gave great weather. And I went to the beach in Bar, and I had a good swim there. Yeah. Uh, the only thing is that I wish my wife and kids were here with me because they love to swim in the sea much more than I do. But anyway, I swam in the sea. That was great. I showed. I sent them my pictures. Yeah. So next time. God willing, when we come here, we'll also visit that place. And finally, we went to Albania. I mean, I went to Albania. And the church was so kind. They were so hospitable to me. And you know, when I was going to Albania, I didn't really know who Albanians are. All I knew about Albanians is what I saw in some movies. Yeah. So I expected to see people like maybe like Iranians, something similar. So when I came there and the guy from the church who met me at the bus station, he took me home and we had just amazing time with him. He was so thirsty for the word of God. He was so thirsty. His name was Enea. We just talked for several hours and then we went and uh, to the church, we met a group of guys there who went for evangelism. And after that, after the evangelism, we went to the center of the city, we went to one of the cafes, and we had like two hours wrap there. And I've been just sharing about the relationship with God, about the testimonies which God has done in my life. So, and it was amazing to see. I mean, they were looking at me and they were like, I saw this thought in their eyes like, Wow, I mean, God is doing these things in people's life. It means it is possible in our lives as well, because God is the same. And, you know, and next Sunday on the service, I also shared, and then we had rap, and when we went together for a walk, and then we had another rap at home. And next morning on Monday, it was like, yeah, I went with that guy in there. We had great time together around the city. And you know, I saw, I loved the Albanian church very much. I loved the people there because in Christ we are one family. And it is like such a great testimony that it makes no difference because we have been redeemed. Yeah. And the last, I mean, on Monday evening, the evening before I left, I left, we had like, a great we had a birthday of one girl Irvisa and that girl she is very beautiful and she has a great heart for God she loves God so much and she has problems with her eyes she her vision deteriorates since she was 12 and she sees very little now and it touched my heart so much and I said let me pray for you and I prayed for her and I'm still praying for her Every day I remember her in my prayers. I wish that God would heal her and then she would testify all over Albania and all over the world about what miracle God has done in her life. Yeah, and after that I went to Macedonia and I was actually surprised that Macedonia looked so different from other places. I mean, Macedonia, I mean, Skopje was beautiful. Good to see you, Rastislav. So, 
I really enjoyed my time in Macedonia and I enjoyed the fact that everything in Macedonia is written in Cyrillic. And actually the language, Macedonian language, is even closer to Russian, so I could understand almost everything there. And I spoke to people in Russian on the streets like 10, 15 times I spoke to people on the streets. And all of them understood me and I understood them. Which is, I mean, even better than here in Serbia, because when I start speaking Russian here in Serbia, people say, uh, sorry, I don't speak Russian. Uh, it's not, it seems not to be a problem in Macedonia for people there. Yeah, and finally I crossed the border and came back home as I wrote to my family, you know, I'm going home to Belgrade. So I got home and now I'm with you. Praise God. Maybe would you like to pray for this girl now as yes. a church? Yes, yes. Yeah. I would like you, I would like to ask you now to open your hearts for the Spirit of God to move through our hearts and think about this girl Irvisa in Albania. So this girl Irvisa from Albanian church, she lives in Tirana and uh, from the age of 12, her eyesight is deteriorating. Every year she sees less and less. And that girl loves God so much and she has a beautiful attitude. You know, with having such a bad eyesight, she comes to evangelism. I mean, she evangelizes, she, you know, she goes with another girl, Elisona, and they share, you know, the gospel and they speak about Jesus. And that also touched my heart so much. So think about this girl and open your heart for the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit would go through your heart and go directly through our prayers and touch Irvisa's eyes. Holy Spirit. I open my heart, we open my heart, so that you would use our spirit and you would go all the way and would touch Irvisa's eyes, Father. Jesus, when you were here on the earth, anyone who came to you for help, anyone who needed healing, you would heal them. Jesus, I ask you, just put your hand on Irvisa's eyes now. Through our prayers, use our spirits, use our hearts. You see our hearts, you see how much we want her to get healed, how much we want her to see clearly, as we do, Father. We ask you just use our faith and touch her eyes right now with your hands through our prayers, Father. As a church, we pray that you would heal her. You know which problems she has, what is wrong there, and although the doctors say that it's impossible for her to get healed, but we know who you are, Father. We have faith in you. We know that you are the one who created our eyes, that you are the one who can do anything, Father. And we have faith in you. We have faith that you can do it, Father. As you healed my eye, as you healed my father's eye, as you healed my wife from uncurable disease, Father, I pray that you would now touch her visa, that you would bring healing to her eyes that you would bring her sight as you did when you were here on earth we pray as you said in your word when two or three are gathered together in your name if you pray in jesus in god's son's precious name you would surely answer father we pray in your son's precious name amen amen hallelujah well, you are beautiful thank you so much Oh. So let's let's pray for Irvisa. Let's pray for other people we know they need prayers. You know, we have uh, so many people not on the list but on our heart that we are praying for. That's uh very uh very important. Before we start, I'll just show you something. Just that you know, we have some uh, Arabic Gospels and we have also uh, beautiful, complete Bibles in, in Farsi. 
which is like the uh, Parsi or old Persian language, Farsi. And I'm saying this because uh, uh, there are these reports about uh, work of God in Islamic countries. And basically now they say that uh, Iran has the fastest growing uh, evangelical Protestant church in the world now in these days under this persecution. Many uh, people uh, uh, come to Christ even though uh, it's not easy there. And I'm saying this because we have a lot of uh, refugees in Belgrade. We are meeting them sometimes. And uh, there is a lot of Afghanis, but also a Iranians. So we have these Bibles, both in Arabic and Farsi. This is a great tool. If you know somebody, let us know. You know, this is yours. This is church thing. We can, we can distribute it freely and give it. This has the power to save lives. Amazing how we are equipped. So just, just the side thought that you know. And uh, now let's turn with me into the book of First John, chapter four. We basically continue this series of First John. And uh, this is so rich portion. I can't get enough of it so rich how God speaks to us so now 1 John 4 and we will start in verse 4 but we will read quickly the previous verses also so for one beloved believe not every spirit and then he says try the spirits whether they are of God because many false prophets are gone, gone out into the world. Many false prophets, false spirits, false teachings. Then he says, by this we know, in verse 2, the Spirit of God, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ came in the flesh is of God. Okay, it deals with this Gnostic uh, teachings, docetism, and many other things. But basically, also we mentioned, it addresses the the Mormons, the Jehovah Witnesses, because God became flesh, Emmanuel, God with us. Every spirit which confesses not that Jesus is Christ, basically is the Messiah, the anointed one, the expected one from the Old Testament, the promised one. Every spirit which does not recognize Jesus as the Christ, verse 3, says, is the spirit of Antichrist. You know, they are bringing different message. They are not bringing Christ. They are bringing something in the place of Christ. Anti means in the place of. Also against, but the real meaning is in the place of Christ. They are bringing some, some false gospel. And then it says here, verse 4. That's where we start. But you are of God. You know, he's speaking to church. He's speaking to his congregation. He's speaking to the group of believers, those who have been born again, those who are saved. And he says, you are of God. Now the question is, are you of God? Are you born again? Are you saved? Do you belong to this family? Is he, are you his child? Because many people, they may live in a religious spirit, just going to church, caving into their own depth of the soul, you know. And we will see later on, there's a difference between soulish and spiritual. Hebrews 4.12 tells us about it. The Word of God shows us. You know, some people may sit in a church and they think they have a nice time with God, but basically it can be soulish. It can be orientation on the depth of their soul, just meditating in their own soul with, their, with themselves. And basically it can be totally a part of God. I'm just saying this. I don't say everybody is like this, but I'm just saying that people should realize, are they of God? Do they know? Have they believed? Have they decided? Is Christ, is Jesus the Messiah? Is he the Christ? 
have they received the forgiveness of sins? Because he says, he addresses the church and he says, you are of God, little children. And then he says, and you have overcome them, those false prophets, or we could say even those false spirits which are behind them. You are the children of God. Now are you? Am I the child of God? And I can say, yes, I am. I know when I studied and pondered upon the word of God, and when I understood the principle of redemption, when God took upon himself my sins and bled on the cross, he was bleeding his blood as a payment for my sins. That's what we were singing in the songs. That's what we were singing in the beginning. Bearing all my sin and shame. Thank you for the price you paid. He paid the redemptive price for us. Have I ever received this? And I did. I remember that, that day and hour. I remember the moment when I kneeled down and I said to God, I, I am I'm a lost sinner. I know like one day when, when I stand before you, I know you can send me to hell, and you will. I knew it. But I came and I said, God, I don't want to go there. Thank you that you paid the price, and I receive you as my personal Savior. And I became the child of God. I am forgiven now. You know, uh, let's be careful about the religious system of works instead of system of faith because God is pleased by faith basically when we turn from ourselves to him when we turn from our own labor and works to the person Jesus Christ the Savior this is very important and then the works will follow then we have a good works because we are in a, in a, in a relationship with Jesus Christ so this is the question, and he says, you are of God, little children. Every one of us should have a clear answer about this. Am I the child of God? You know, and if, if you watch us and you have some doubts, ask. You know, we are able to, ready to answer. We are ready to sit down and speak about it. This is very important. This is, this is the question of life and death. In simple words, do you know, are you saved? We need to know this. That's why we study and learn of him and of his works. And we call it finished work. Because when Jesus was crucified, John 19.30, he called upon the Father and he said, It is finished. You know, and then, then the darkness and earthquake and, and all hell broke out, you know, around him. And the soldiers saw it and they said, he, he, he was a really righteous man. And when he's called, it is finished, he said, tetelestai in the Greek. Which means it's been completely summarized and nothing else needs to be added. It's complete, teleo, tetelestai. Completed. The payment is complete. It's like if you get the bill from, from MTS and you have to pay it. Or you get the bill from, uh, I don't know, the other companies, VIP, you know, uh, Telenor. Well, you have a bill and you have to pay. But Jesus said it's paid in full. Nothing else needs to be added. And we have to cast ourselves on this. This is the faith. This is the trust. I trust Jesus. I trust this work of Father that this sacrifice was enough for me. Rewinding back into Old Testament, we've seen these pictures. The lamp was sacrificed for the sins of Israel. And then the forgiveness was granted. It's the same principle. Nothing ever changed. Nobody in the Old Testament was saved through being good. It was through the faith in the Lamb of God. That's why the priest once a year has brought the Lamb for the sins of the whole Israel. And then there were other sacrifices for personal sins. So we are the children of God, he says here. 
and he says you have overcome these false prophets because now you have different spirit you you know this teaching you know that god became flesh emmanuel dwelt with us you are not confused about jesus christ you know he is the messiah you are not receiving these strange new teachings and you are one of his and then he says because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world and we spoke about this uh, the previous sunday uh, this is great power you know many many people can be scared of spiritual activity but basically when we realize that the one in us if we have received christ into our heart if we have the relationship with him he is greater than the one in the world it's amazing when you play cards you know seven you know king and then somebody takes the ace and you have the ace of hearts you know the, the highest card ever you know it overrules everything that's what we have we have god on our side the creator and god who is so loving the one in us is greater than all these false teachers and spirits and you know what the light cast out darkness as we walk as we walk in the light as and as he is in the light we have fellowship one with one another but also with one another in the church you know and the darkness has to flee so <clears throat> we have this great power but now what he says in verse 5 they now speaking about them they are of the world therefore they speak of the world and the world hears them so these different strange false prophets teachers and they can be even in the churches different preachers pastors uh, uh, priests they can speak some things but they are if they are not the children of God they are of the world and they speak the things of the world now big danger in nowadays is a YouTube you know many people go on YouTube and they watch different churches different sermons different theological teachings basically uh, the people who go there they never studied who that person is who is teaching it they go just by feelings they turn on the youtube they play some channel there's a ni nice graphic nice design wow it's cool you know you play it uh it it impresses your emotions you like it and you say that's it i, I love it i love it but little little do, do people know that may maybe this man is totally off and he's known for his wrong teaching but if people do not study they just listen they get confused very easily and maybe you will hear these things like very popular things in nowadays society and they come with the message and they say be yourself it sounds very christian because we say god receives you as you are which is truth you know just just calm as you are because many people have this false, false concept well i want to come to church i have to put my life in order you know and then i come with a beautiful family smiling nicely dressed and then i can go to church which is wrong concept because yeah many people most of them uh, they just don't. Uh, Go ahead. They just. Huh. Uh, they just don't have clear picture what uh, your words means. What, what your words as uh, some they, they receive just as theory, but they, they don't have clear picture what these words uh, regard to in life, in real life. What does it mean in real life to to live it? You know. So 
just listen and that's something that affects uh, feelings, but they, they don't uh, are not able to use it in, in real life. Yes, that's a very good point. So we, we should actually talk about uh, poem on my own machine. What do you say? Poem on the terms. Terms, yeah, terms. yeah, yeah. Yeah, very good what uh, Rastislav said, you know, I'll just repeat it. That many people, they don't know how to apply it in life, how to live it, you know. And he mentioned also we should speak about terms, making some definitions. Very good point, yeah. Yeah, so what I wanted to say that many people have this concept of this Holy God and the church, the place of meeting the Holy God. And in order to meet the Holy God, you have to put your life in order, you know. But the other side is truth, because God says, come. He's not waiting for you to put your life in order, find a job, find a wife, have a good salary, raise up the kids, uh, do something for community, and then you will be received by God. No, God takes anybody, basically. And we see this in the Bible. God was speaking with the outcasts, with the adulterers, with the prostitutes, with the, with the thieves. And God came to them and he said, I have a plan for your life. God is not waiting for us to change our life and come to him. No, God comes to us and changes our life. So basically the truth is come as you are. But it continues. God will not leave you the way you are. But some ideas around in the world, they appeal on, on, on sentimentality and human heart, and they say, just be yourself. You don't need to change. God will receive you. Be yourself. Yeah, that, 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 uh, that uh, yourself is their identity, not our identity. Yes, yes. And that's the wrong, because God says... Maybe you remember, Pastor Stevens used to teach two things. He was speaking about individuality and personality. Okay? God honors our individuality. Every one of us is individuum in God's eyes. But he is changing our personality. Because many people will come, they will sit, and they will say, well, I could never help with the kids or I could never speak with somebody on the street I'm not that kind of person you know? uh, uh. but that's what God wants to change the personality somebody will say well I get angry easily well I'm this way that's what God wants to change it's not be yourself it's never about self it's always about him that's why we come and we say here am I. Like, look at me. And God says, I will use it. I will use it. I will use you. If you give yourself to me, I will use you. And we see this in the pictures. Who was the Peter? Peter was the turbulent man. He was the one who got like, easily, you know, like, angry. Impulsive. God said, he didn't say, be yourself. He said, I'll work with it. I'll work with it. I'm able. And then there were others who were in fear. You know, disciples gathered after Jesus' death in the upper room. And they were behind the locked door that nobody sees them. They were in fear. It's not be yourself. Somebody can say, well, I have a fear. I'm afraid to talk to people. Oh no, God can change this. The Holy Spirit came and what happened? From behind the locked doors in the fear, in the moment they are on the street testifying. When we are in relationship with God, He is changing our personality. And I'm just saying this because there are many popular statements out there in the world. And it's not even psychology. It sounds like they say it's Christianity, but it's not. Another one is, it's like, let it go, you know, let it go. It's a very popular now, let it go. Is there like some problem? Let it go. Just don't be bothered by it. 
just let it go, let it be, and be free. And what they mean by it, they speak about relationships. You know, man having a hard time with his wife, not able to solve it, and the friends came to the wife and they say, you know what, let it go, be free. Don't ruin your life, just let it go. But God is different. In the second Samuel, chapter 23, there is this passage uh, speaking about God's uh, mighty man, or actually David's mighty man. Okay, David has his mighty man, uh, which gathered around him. Second Samuel 23. Second Samuel 23, verse 11. David speaks about them. And he says, one of these mighty men, by the way, these mighty men were the people who were uh, in debt, in troubles. We spoke about this. They were indebted. Uh, they were in distress. This is Second Samuel 22. And they gathered around David, around their uh, leader. First Samuel 22, 2. I'll read this one when we go back. First Samuel 22, verse 2. And everyone that was in distress, meaning in a narrow place under pressure, and everyone that was in debt, and everyone that was discontented this word is bitter soul mar mar nefesh you know bitter soul they gathered themselves around him and he became captain over them so you see these are the mighty men of david this is the mighty army it doesn't say they were like superheroes it says they were in troubles they had a debt they were in a narrow place they didn't know where to go they had a bitter soul the people and the world heard them. They didn't know where to go. So they gathered around David and he became their captain. This is what we do. This is us. We have so many problems, but we gather around our captain, the Jesus Christ, and he leads us. And the gathering here on earth is we gather in a church. We gather, you know. Doesn't matter if we are in debt, in distress. And God changes us and makes us. You remember uh, how he said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. He doesn't say, those who are able to fish for men, come here. No, he says, follow me and I'll make you. God doesn't say, if you are able to speak eloquently, like Priscilla and Aquila, you know, come and follow me. No, he says, Follow me and I'll make you a good preacher. God doesn't say if you are a good husband, come to church and follow me. He says, no, if you are a piece of trash, just come and I'll make you a good husband. Come as you are, but I will not leave you the way you are. God will change it. So these people gathered around him. And it says here, we mentioned that Second Samuel 23, there's this big hero. I mean, this is written in our Bibles. Look at this. Second Samuel. Sorry, I jumped into Second Kings. Back to Second Samuel 23, verse 11. And after him was Shammah, the son of Egi, the Har Hararite. And the Philistines gathered together into troop, where was a piece of ground full of lentils. And the people fled from the Philistines. So now imagine there is a village, they have a little field, it's full of lentils. It's, it's their provision, it's their food. This is how they live. This is our food. This is how we live. It was their bread. But the Philistines came and, and attacked, and the people ran away. Now imagine you are one of these guys who have problems, who are in distress, in debt. You are like nobody. And the enemy comes. 
and everybody from the village flees and you are left alone. You know what this guy did? This guy who was despised by the world, who had troubles with his own soul, maybe he was bitter. It says here, verse 12, but he stood in the midst of the ground and defended it and slew the Philistines and the Lord wrought or gave him great victory. He said, I will stand the ground. I am not fleeing. Because I've learned who is my captain. I know who Jesus is. I'm, I'm not going to be moved by the enemy. I'm standing and I'm fighting for this piece of little lentils. I'm not going to give it to the enemies. Maybe some other people will run away. Maybe the educated, the nice ones. But I will stand the ground and fight. We are called soldiers in the Bible many times. And maybe people will give up on you. But remember, God will never give up on you. And we have this position when we can stand and we can fight in prayers, in investment. I'll tell you something. You know what this piece of lentil is? It has no value. That's why people fled. If there would be the field full of gold, maybe they would fight. It wasn't something big for them. These children, this little boy, who will fight for him? Look at him. He's like the piece of lentil. He's so small. And the enemy comes. And I'm saying, by the grace of God, I will fight for him. I will pray. I will invest the word of God. When I make a mistake, I'll, I'll just tell him, I I'm sorry, Daddy is not perfect, but we have perfect God. Daddy has a bitter soul. Daddy has debts. He's indebted. He owns money. But hey, we have great captain. I will fight for this little boy. And I will fight for the little girl over there on the street. She's begging money. Maybe people will misuse her. But we can fight. We can stand the ground. What is required? That we are perfect? No. That we just realize our captain. We are different. We are of God. Those hirelings, those who do it for money, they will run away. That's what Jesus says. They do it for money and when the enemy comes, where are they? But we are different. We are of God. We know what is important. We, do, we don't receive this easy peasy message. Be yourself. Let it go. No, I will not let it go. I will fight for my marriage. I will fight for my children. I will fight for my friends. I, and if they ring my bell at midnight, you remember the story? Give me bread, give me bread. Let's open and give them bread. That's why we are here. This is the church. Not to let it go, but fight for the last lentil. Maybe some person at the end of Serbia in the south border. Maybe there is somebody on the east border of Serbia and we will go there. And who is ready, come and join us. We will go, we will eat, we will eat chavap or burek, we will pray on the bank of the river and then we will evangelize. We have this word of life. We can save people from taking their lives. We can save people from being in depression. Do you know what's the answer? The answer is not be yourself. The answer is not let it go. The answer is come. Let's gather around our captain. First Samuel, First Samuel uh, 22, verse 2. Let's gather around our captain. We will take the stand and we will not give those people to Satan. He has his own agenda. He is taking people and stealing them. He is blinding their eyes. And then he puts them into chains of slavery, into troubles. 
But we are here with another message, with the message of freedom. Not the message of perfectness. Be perfect, be perfect. Be the best. And be one of us. No, our message is, who are we? We are like the mighty man of David. What's the mighty man? The mighty man is a person who has a lot of troubles, but he gathers around his captain, the faithful one. This is our message, and this is the, the beauty and power of it. And it says here back in a in a first John chapter four. First John chapter four. We have it here. Uh, we continue in verse six. First John chapter four, six. And we are of God. That's why we said we are different. And he that knows God hears us. That's what the apostle says. And he says, those who know God, they hear us. Now, do you know God? Do I know God? And I believe we do. And we are learning of him. But in his essence, we know him. And that's why we hear these apostles. That's why we hear them. This is their word. This is what they spoke. Do you hear this word? Well, God help us. We are learning it. But we, we are learning it and we are hearing it. We are obeying it. That's why we study it. This word. And that's what he says. He says, the one, we are of God. And he that knows God, hears us. So basically, if we study the Bible, if we follow the Bible, he says, this is the sign that we know God. Because we are listening to them. And there are so many people who will say today, I'm a Christian, and they never read the Bible. They never follow the Bible. They may be going to church, maybe even hearing the Bible, but they don't listen to the Bible. I'll give you, I'll give you just an example. Ephesians 4.11 says that God gave some things. God gave gifts, okay? God gave. God gave 4.11. He gave pastors, teachers for the equipping of the body. And now when you ask people, do you go to church? Because God gave the church. It was his idea. God said, I will build my church. And when you ask some people, do you go to church? We spoke with them yesterday at other shopping mall. Yeah, yeah. How often? Twice a year. Božić i Slava. Oh, okay. Here you go. Do you really hear his word? Do you know God? And you know, no. These people, they don't know God. We have to tell them that they would learn God and God would open their ears. Another one is premarital sex. I'll show you immediately if the people hear God. Premarital sex. It means sex outside of marriage. You meet young people. They walk hand to hand. And you come and you say, do you love her? The guy says, yeah, I do, I do. Do you know that 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient? Can you wait till marriage? Ah, you know, yeah, but, but, you know, we live in different age. Even Christians say this, this. Christians say this. You know, we live in a modern age. Oh, really? It says here, he that knows God hears us. If we are hearing and obeying him, we know God. If we do our own things, we are off. And then it says, and by this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. This is so easy. Do we love the word of God? Do we understand? Do, do we believe it? Do we take it as the truth? This is the spirit of truth. And which goes against it. Yeah, but you know, we live in modern society and we don't have to wait, you know. And oh, That's the spirit of error. It's a different teaching. That's not what the Bible teaches and the apostles. I'm just saying these two simple examples just to illustrate how people claim they are Christians and they love God and yet they live in the spirit of error. And we will finish with this one. It says here, 
Hebrews 4.12, 4, he said that the word of God will show us, because it's sharp, than any two-edged sword dividing. Hebrews 4.12, it says, For the word of God is quick, powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword. Sharp. And now what does it do? What does it do? Piercing and dividing soul and spirit. The word of God will show if our behavior and thinking is soulish or spiritual. Well, I believe and I think in my soul that, you know, oh really, this is what you believe. It's a soulish. Because the word of God says something else. This is spiritual. If I, if I live in accordance with the word of God, I'm a spiritual man. If I live in something which looks spiritual, but it's not like this, I'm a soulish man. Psychikos, carnal, normal. There is nothing from the spirit, nothing from God. So this is amazing how the word of God is sharp and showing us. And uh, verse 7, 1 John, verse 7. 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. It says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. Let us love the church, the people in the church. And you know, I'm so happy for our ministry. We were in Budapest, in Greater Grace Church with Pastor Kende. And you know what? They loved us. They don't even know us and they loved us. People came and they, they, they gave us an apartment to live. They gave us a key and they said, just stay there. We went on the boat and I was like, we don't have a ticket. Where do I pay? And they said, you know, just come. We came and they made this big feast. And they invited us as the guests of honor. And they said, you sit here and you just eat as much as you want. And then we had a fellowship and we talked and prayed and studied the Bible. They loved us so much. You know, when you go to Eurocon, it's the same. People just love you. When you go to Baltimore for a convention, it's the same spirit. People just love you and they are there for you to help. And when you come here, and I believe we want to have the same spirit because it says here, love is of God. And and you remember this verse, John 13, 35. Uh, how the world knows we are his disciples. If you love one another, they will know you are my disciples. And this is what we want, to be known and characterized by loving the world and loving one another. Because if God is in our midst, it's so easy to love brothers. And I'm telling you, this will be the place where we will love people. Anybody who comes through this door, we will love him, we will help him in any and every possible way. And we can be part of this extended hand of God. Imagine God is looking down from heaven and he wants to help and speak to people and save them. And we can be part of it, and we are. So this is beautiful. Beloved, and he says, first, you are loved, beloved. You are loved. And then he says, let's love one another. So thank you. God bless you. We will have a debate, rap session. We will talk about it. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God.